Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanna Rabotham. I am the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Tampa Museum of Art. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's afternoon uh, virtual Zoom panel entitled A Heritage That Endures, Voices of Contemporary Artists. We are so thrilled that this offered us an opportunity to collaborate with the Hillsborough County um, staff on uh, creating this wonderful and important program that celebrates the unique artists and cultures that are living and thriving in Hillsborough County. I would like to thank the three artists who are here with us this afternoon, and we will be talking a bit about their artwork. We'll be talking about just their life's work in general, and we will be taking also some questions from our audience. So as you listen to our conversation, view the artwork, um, please feel free to submit questions in your uh, Q&A chat, and we will try to get to them at the end of our presentation. Today's format will go um, pretty smoothly and casually. I will speak with the artist for um, approximately half hour, 35 minutes. We will look at their images um, they've provided so we can have a little bit more of an in-depth look at their practice. We will also have a bit of a conversation amongst us where I'll ask our artists questions. And then again, we will open it at the end for um, audience Q&A. That being said, I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists here today. It's my pleasure to introduce Tony Weldon. Tony began his career in the fifth grade. Encouraged by his teacher, he, uh, he developed his talent and pursued his passion to create art. Tony is a graduate of Reinhardt College with a degree in fine arts and a bachelor's degree in fine arts from the Ringling College of Art. He has worked with Harley Davidson and is a professor at the Tampa Arts Institute. He has contributed a graphite illustration titled Learning How to Fly to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. And he also has two pieces on permanent display at the Booth Western Museum in Cartersville, Georgia. Tony is of Cherokee descent. Next, we have Craig Thomas Marks. Craig is an internationally exhibited contemporary artist. He briefly attended Kendall College of Art and Design, but elected to dedicate his time and evolve his creative side through his close friendships and personal pursuit of art. He is of the Blackfoot Confederacy heritage and the Blackfeet culture is evident throughout his artwork and is the inspiration in his ledger art traditional practice. He is also a passionate and actively involved in preserving Native Americans, specifically the Blackfeet language, which he uses intentionally to name his art. I'm also pleased to introduce to my right, Corrine Zapeda. Corrine grew up in Naples, Florida in a multicultural family and is Seminole and Mexican. Her passion for art started as a child, watching her artist, Brian Zapeda, using traditional methods to create beaded, bandolier bags and moccasins, as well as leather work, silver work, and more. Corrine is self-taught and her work has been exhibited at the Atatiki Museum in Clouston, the Collier County Museum and the History, um, and at History Fort Lauderdale. Most recently, she was one of 12 artists selected to display her illustrations and textile work at Reclaiming Home Contemporary Seminole art at Sarasota's Ringling Museum, the first ever exhibit of its kind in the region, if not the state. The state. <laughs> yeah, incredible. So welcome. We are very pleased to have you here this afternoon. Um, I should note here that we are um, collaborating with Hillsborough County on this panel in celebration of Native American Heritage Month, which is celebrated throughout the month of November. And um, we hope that we can continue these discussions um, throughout the year. It's important that we not only celebrate, but acknowledge the indigenous artists living in our region. Um, with that, I would like to um, go through the slides so we can have our audience take a peek at your work. Our artists. So we're welcoming Craig Thomas Marks first to speak about his artwork. If you wouldn't mind, I think we have about three slides of your artwork. If you want to just briefly run us through um, some of your motifs, inspiration, 
um, and what led to you know the finalized work that we see on the screen? Sure. This this one it's called Umkapina. It's um, it it was originally for an exhibit that was kind of challenged down in Sarasota with uh, I was paired with a small ancient artifact of kind of unknown origin and asked to do a reimagining of it. Uh, in this piece, uh, I've taken a number of washes. There's a number of layers through this. And uh, we kind of, through a bunch of research, talking to some anthropologists that I knew, we kind of determined that the, the, the stone sculpture was that of Kubera, which is the, uh, the uh, Hindu god of prosperity and wealth. So if you look closely, what I've done is in, I kind of threw a little bit of my uh, ledger tradition in there and ledger art uh, involves creating something on an old ledger document. So in the background, you can see some scribbles and those scribbles are actually um, representations of the uh, oldest known Buddhist uh, sutra in existence. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the, uh, the wheel of fire with Kubera in the middle, uh, the, the cosmic fire and the ring symbolizing eternity. And in there uh, also for a little balance and superimposed is the uh, Sanskrit word for prosperity. Uh, wanted to kind of give it the, uh, the prosperous vibe and a positive vibe uh, in this particular piece. So there's also a little hidden gem in there for those of you who know how to see it. Uh, Unkapina is the Blackfoot word for Buddha. It kind of translates to fat man. Uh, there, obviously there was no, uh, no understanding of Buddha in, uh, in Blackfoot culture you know, back at that time. So we use uh, you know, pictograms uh, and there may be something in there that would symbolize the Buddha. Fantastic. Just for our audience at home, um, could you briefly describe what ledger art is? Uh, ledger art is actually what, what connected. I'm a reconnecting native. Uh, my mother, uh, my biological mother was, um, or is enrolled Pagani uh, Blackfeet out of Browning, Montana. And for the last seven or eight years, trying to connect uh, with that culture and learn and understand, you know, where it was that I came from, I was introduced to ledger art by a guy named Terence Gardipi, uh, who is kind of an OG in ledger art. And what what that really is is uh, when natives were in trade back way way back when uh, we had what was called winter count, and you would uh, people would would take and highlight and record the significant events of the year on Buffalo Hyde. Uh, once internment began and the colonization of, of the West happened and, and they were uh, people were put into camps and things like that, it shifted from Buffalo Hyde to whatever they could find. And often that was uh, sheets of paper that the guards would give to them. And over time that has kind of evolved and, and it, Terrence is actually one of the ones who kind of helped to revive that tradition again. And now the older the paper we can find, the better. And that's really what got me into the storytelling aspect was you would see this piece of paper, especially if it was, um, the, some of my first ones were checks from the Browning uh, reservation. Mm -hmm. And it would, I, would, I would just kind of sit there and stare at that and, and try and pull a story from what that old document was. Um, and there's a, a lot of very prominent ledger artists out there right now. And uh, it, it, it's tremendously fun for me to be able to look at different ones and be able to go, hey, that's, you know, this person or that's that person. I know oh, that's Dolores Purdy. You know, you can, you can tell by everybody's unique style. Um, but it's a tradition that's been going on since, you know, the beginning of time. Fantastic. You know, for us, so. Thank you. Um, let's get the next slide. Oh. Uh, the Indian, yeah, this is called Highway Song. Uh, this is a piece that I did for a recent charity auction to benefit uh, Eugene Brave Rock and the Oki Language Project. Uh, this is um, actually inspired by the old Blackfoot, the rock band, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the song uh, Highway Song. When I was a kid, I would listen to that and I would had nothing to do with the lyrics, but I could picture myself, you know, while I was out there working the fields on the farm, I just pictured myself on my motorcycle just going. And uh, I came across this, this uh, representation of a, an Indian motorcycle. And the front man for that band is a guy named Ricky Medlock. He's now the guitarist for Leonard Skinner. And he has, he's, he's a Lakota and he has Indian tattooed on his arm. And I'm like, oh, so not only did I, I get that connection between the song the motorcycle and the piece, 
but uh, in the final version of this painting, uh, Ricky Medlock signed it for me. Oh, so great. Okay. I, this was part of a trilogy I called the Dark Horse Trilogy, and I used three of those three of those pieces, but this was probably my favorite one of those three. It's done with only three paints, um, black, white, and crimson. So, Do you use acrylic or oil? I use house oh, paint. House paint? Wow. <laughs> I use house paint a lot. We'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, Ashley Calling Bowl. This is an example of uh, ledger work. This was also one done for the Oki Language Project. This one can be actually seen. It's available down at Red Cloud Indian Arts in St. Petersburg. This is a representation of uh, Ashley Calling Bowl, who is uh, a Cree, and she was also the first Indigenous Miss Universe. And uh, I worked with her a little bit um, in a previous um, fundraiser for the Dreamcatcher Foundation. And so she signed this piece for me. And this is also another one. A lot You'll find a lot of these pieces are available um, to benefit Indigenous charities. So. Fantastic. Oh, uh, this is Jenny. This is a, a portrait I did for um, an exhibit for Women's History Month down in Sarasota. Uh, this one is... Yeah, it kind of says what it says. I, I haven't done, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with the use of light in paintings mm -hmm. and it's something that I try to learn. And so that's what this actually started out to be. It was an experiment in uh, composition and light. And is this paint as well or is it charcoal? No, that's Oops. house paint again. House paint. <laughs> Thank you, fantastic. This is Lazy Boy. Uh, Lazy Boy was a Blackfoot warrior. Uh, one of the things that I do uh, in a lot of my portraits, there's a reason that I do them. Uh, again, as far as connecting to the history and the culture, uh, I try and get to know my ancestors and I channel that through painting. So when I, I do a painting, especially like this, I'm I'm reading everything I can. I'm talking to people. I'm 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 kind of immersing myself in that subject. Uh, this was another one. This was done recently for the Oki Language Project uh, auction, and uh, I wanted to do something that was you know just flat out straight in your face Blackfoot, and I couldn't think of anything better than you know a, a piece like this with a the traditional you know war bonnet. Uh, it, that's where this kind of came from. And through doing projects like this, I read their stories, I read their war records and, and, and really try and get to know who that individual was. There's, there's all kinds of stuff on, on this guy, but there's a, a ledger piece that I did of him. The first pic picture I ever saw of this gentleman, uh, he's sitting outside his lodge and in his hand, he's got a Colt revolver in his hand. And it was the, the look on his face at that time was, uh, yeah, you, we're, we're not conquered. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the, uh, just the, that, that power in that, that glance. And so when I came across this piece, uh, this is the one that uh, I decided I would use, so. Fantastic. Thank you, Craig. And <laughs> we'll move on to Corrine Zapata now. Oh my goodness, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, this piece is called Kareen's Doll. That's me, I'm Kareen. Uh, it's a, just an image of uh, one of our seminal dolls that I did. It's part of a series of three different images that all kind of reflect me and my culture and my family and my heritage. Um, but this was the first of three in that series. I think now there's like four or five different images, but the first, this is one of the first three. Um, it's digital, so I start out in Illustrator or Procreate and I kind of just go to town. Um, my process is very different than a lot of other people's. Um, mm -hmm. Once I start a piece, I will not stop until it's finished. Um, mm -hmm. If that means that I'm sitting with an iPad or you know, a different sort of digital item in my hand for 24 or 48 hours, that's what it means to me. But for some mm -hmm. reason, I just can't stop until it's finished. Um, so I don't know, it's just a seminal doll, but my way. 
Wonderful. <laughs> Contemporary interpretation of a yes. single doll? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and this is another one. So this is actually later, like one of the other five. Um, but this one was actually commissioned. Um, so it's a, a man and woman doll. Um, same thing, kind of just a more modern representation. It's titled Watch and Thought, and that means mom and dad in our language in uh, Alaponge. Um, same thing, a digital work. Oh, goodness. Okay, this is my beadwork, um, which is kind of how I started out in art. Mm -hmm. um, so we do like these giant netted necklaces, which of mm -hmm. course I didn't wear one and I probably should have. But um, <laughs> so they're like every single piece, every single bead is connected to the next one. So every single one of those, it's one giant piece of string that is then like latticed pretty much mm -hmm. into create like a net. Um, and they take a good amount of time, but they're a lot of fun for me. Um, and I feel very uh, connected to my people when I make them, which mm -hmm. is really nice. Um, and so traditionally we would um, trade for beads with people who would come and visit us in the Everglades, whether that be Spaniards or English people, German people, whoever it was to get different mm -hmm. materials. And one of those materials that we valued very highly was uh, glass beads. So wow. that's why I like to use glass beads. <laughs> Fantastic. It's gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This one was actually for an exhibit at History Fort Lauderdale um, that was kind of focused around post mid mid pandemic, post pandemic um, feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and so I titled it For Your Trauma. And actually, that is, I don't know if you guys can see, it's like less than three inches big in real life. Oh, so wow. it's really tiny. Um, and it was kind of like, I felt at the moment, you know, we were using, um, we we're slapping band-aids on situations that needed like full construction, you know? Mm. Um, and so it's kind of a play on like, here, you know, here's, you know, a, something to fix yourself with. And it's, you know, I don't know, just my sense of humor, I guess. <laughs> but um, they're tiny little size, uh, 13 seed beads. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's about three inches. And then on the back of that, which you can't see, um, there's some leather work on the back with like, a, it's a pin attachment. So you would be able to like pin it onto a shirt or a jacket or something of that sort. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. This is another one that also went into that same exhibit at History Fort Lauderdale called We the People. Um, and this is kind of, I sewed the face mask and then I attached, you know, the beads onto the face mask. Um, those are again, like super, super tiny size 13 seed beads. Um, but this is kind of like, pandemic was going on. We have the missing and murdered indigenous people, um, red hand on one side and the Black Lives Matter fist on the other side. Um, and I often get asked why. Um, we face a lot of the same problems, uh, people of color. And I think at that moment we were going through a, a pandemic, then we had the indigenous, missing murdered indigenous people crisis as well as the Black Lives Matter crisis. And um, I myself have gone and marched on Washington for both matters. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt that I saw a lot of the same people at the two marches, right? And so I felt like we were walking hand in hand in this battle and that's kind of my visual representation of that. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Tony. Hey. Um. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is a, a large, um, what they call sepia tone painting of Teate. And Teate is, like it says, the Chickasaw storyteller. She's a very famous for during the time, and I believe it's during Roosevelt's time she was asked to come to perform. Well, when it was over, the wife of the president told him that these people need to speak their own language. They need to pray to their own gods. They need to be able to do what they want to do. We have given them uh, restrictions that they can't speak their own language. They can't believe the way they want to. And so he signed a declaration saying they have the freedom to do that. We cannot treat them badly because they're doing what they believe. And, uh, I admire her. She is part of a, a series of paintings I did about strong women. And uh, she's one of my favorites that I talk about. And I also, when I teach, I show this to my students saying that we are all storytellers. That's our reason for being on earth, especially artists. We're here to tell a story, whether it's about yourself, someone else, or 
a situation that's happening in that time is storytelling. And we want that uh, want that to live on. We want people to, to know and keep it going. And I can tell from my friends here the same thing with them. Everything they do is to tell a story. We don't want people to forget. Yeah, that's beautiful. We'll get into that too in our discussion. Okay. Uh, this one I called Mother and Child. And the uh, reason I'm doing a series also of animals is uh, that we do have an epidemic, not just with Native Americans, but with all classes of people of uh, families being separated. As you can tell there's not a father. It's the mother and child. She's taking care of the child. She's watching over the child. And that's what we want to do. We want people, and not just, like I said, Native Americans, we want all people to come together and become one, take care of each other, and not just do your thing and leave that other person with no help whatsoever. And so this is part of a series. This is, uh, uh, nobody knows this person's name. I've gotten several different names for it, but he's a Taos Indian boy. He's very young. And it's part of also the sepia tone paintings. And as you can tell, like, even though I'm Cherokee, I, I paint all nationalities and all uh, the tribes. I believe that we are all one and that I try to do research on everybody, even when right now this is one color. But when I do my more colorful paintings, I look up where they're from, mm -hmm. what they wear, how they live. So that way my research is telling us a proper story. I'm not trying to put a Cherokee in the middle of Nevada or an Apache somewhere up in uh, New York. They're, I wanna make sure everything's correct. And that's another thing I stress for students to do your research, take the time to do research and learn. The more you learn, the better you are. And are these based on um, photographs from, from books or photographs that you have found? How do you find the source material? Well, just like you said, from books, <laughs> things I've found, people that have given me pictures that they've gotten. I've even gotten photos from the Library of Congress, wow. you know, just to do my research to find out more and more about this, because that's, I want to, like I said, tell a story. And I have had other people saying that I'm, more like a historian than an art artist, but I think I'm both. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <they don't. laughs> Do you go out looking specifically for one person or is it just through your, your own research that you then find maybe? Um, it's probably mostly because of my research. I, I'll just be either reading or even if I hear a story on television or something, I want to know what's going on. Who is, who is that? Why is that important? Mm -hmm. And then I do my painting on that. I, and I do different sizes and different colors. I do a lot of uh, graphic pencil work also, because a lot of people like that also. Great. And this one's called Something to Say. And it was just something fun I wanted to do. I wanted to have like the, the father figures out there being serious. And of course the kid just can't take it anymore and has to howl. <laughs> so it's sort of like we are when we're kids, how we grow up. But I also know the wolf is very important to Native Americans. It uh, shows strength, nobility, and uh, wisdom. Great. And this one's called the call. And uh, I, I like that because, you know, you have the call that come out. We want everybody to come together, whether it's a, a celebration, whether it's a warning, whether it's uh, just to get together to say something the call is to get your attention. And uh, that's what I think we need to do more is to put the call out there. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be in the back seat all the time. Right. Oh, let's go back. Brittany, if you can go back to the slide that has all three artists while we have our discussion. It's interesting while we're pulling up the slide, um, even just in this brief introduction to your work, there are common themes that I can see easily that pull out um, from your works. So one of them is this notion of community, which I think I've heard all three of you talk about. Would you mind just um, in your own words, you know, talk about that, that notion of community, what it means to you, who do you feel is, you know, who is the community? Um, I hope I'm not getting too abstract here, but I'd love to hear you more <laughs> kind of expand on that notion of community in your artwork. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> okay. uh, I guess with community is to me means family. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be part of the family being born into it, but you're part of the family 
when you are involved, when you are participating, when you're helping, or even when you're asking for help, you're not too afraid to be part of this group and to learn and to help. Mm -hmm. And that's something I, I think the country really needs right now. It's just everybody needs to come together and quit pointing fingers. And my main objective for the longest time is just to get all Native American tribes to come together as one. Mm -hmm. And if that can happen, then the rest of the world should be able to also, if not just the United States, instead of dividing, saying I'm better than you. Right. And I believe that is coming and I believe that's happening, that the tribes are coming closer together and helping each other and talking to each other and not separating. How does that happen? Just like this. I was going to say, like this, <laughs> this is a perfect example. Conversation yeah. and talking and, and letting down your guard and your walls. Yeah. That's, that's the, the only way to do it is just is talking. That's fantastic. And do you, do you all do that in person? Do you do it over Zoom? <laughs> For me personally, I meet a lot of other people on social media. <laughs> I'm, I'm mm -hmm. 25 yes. years yeah. old, so I'm constantly on social media. Um, <laughs> it's probably one of the biggest ways I actually get my art out to the rest of the general population. Mm -hmm. But I also find a lot of other Native artists, um, mm -hmm. and then they have friends who then I just become friends with. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with like, I travel a lot. And then with that travel, I tend to visit native communities every single time I go somewhere. So like I just went to Montana and I visited with the Crow people and I got to know them a lot better. Um, and then recently I've been reconnecting with um, our sister cousin tribe, Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And I got, got to know a lot of them and converse with them and we're all the same people when it boils down to it right um and i think just understanding that and we all you know within each tribe face relatively the same problems every day mm -hmm. from day to day and i think just understanding that helps you understand each other one better yeah yeah absolutely. <laughs> and yeah. it's something that it, it's it's deeply embedded within the the indigenous communities i didn't realize it so much growing up how i did living where i do uh, but when I went to uh, the reservation, when I stayed, uh, when we throw around this word brother a lot, uh, kind of casually uh, in, in, in American culture. Uh, but what I found when uh, within the native community, it's kind of, it, it's, it's meant, it, it's not, it's not just a flippant thing that people say, mm -hmm. everybody's an auntie, everybody's an uncle, everybody's a niece, everybody's a nephew. And what I observed is, um, a true, the truest sense of community. Um, hey, where'd your kid go? I don't know. You know, he's, he's a, it, it, but it didn't matter because we knew that, you know, it, it was sent the next day, you know, we'll just go pick him up from, you know, uncle's house over here. Right. Everybody does look after each other. They do care mm -hmm. about each other. Uh, and it, it was astonishing to me. I had, I hadn't experienced that really um, un, until being there. And I agree. That's, uh, we need more of that and, and less of all of this, this division. It's just it's not getting us anywhere. Um, so to elaborate that, on that a little bit more, we've talked about kind of the, the macro sense of community, but what about community here in the Tampa Bay area? I've been talking about both kind of indigenous communities here as well as say an indigenous artist community. Um, how, um, for our audiences at, at home, um, you know, what is it like here, that sense of community, and then also just the um, artist community as well? If there is, maybe you'll say that there is not an indigenous artist community. For, for me personally, I have not experienced an indigenous artist community. Um, and I don't know if that's because there's so few of us um, <laughs> that honestly, this is my first time meeting either one of them. <laughs> so it's a great that we were able to connect here because then right. I can take that connection further in, in our careers. Um, but then, for me specifically, um, I'm really young <laughs> and people always look at me like, does she belong in these spaces? Mm -hmm. So I feel like sometimes it's a little off-putting um, meeting other artists in the area mm -hmm. because I'm so young. Um, I don't know if it's the same for you guys. Uh, no, I'm old. 
<laughs> I went on the oldest. But I don't, I, it's, it's just one of the challenges I think I face specifically um, is age um, and ageism against. Maybe generation gap. Yeah. And I think yeah. there's something with like having now been exhibited in the same spaces as people much older than me. I think mm-hmm. I'm kind of gaining a little bit more of a respect, mm-hmm. yeah. um, but Absolutely. definitely glad that we've made this connection today though. That way, hopefully we can build an indigenous artist community because that would be awesome. I would love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would love much. that. <laughs> because Tampa does really have one. Yeah. I mean, the, there's a couple of little galleries here and there mm-hmm. that carry indigenous mm-hmm. art, but in general, no. It's, and that also doesn't mean that they live here. They right, could have right. dropped off their of, work. Or, west, yeah. yeah. What I so. I have experienced is that uh, it, it's, we're less than one percent of the population. It's not a huge demographic. It's not a big voice, and therefore, it often gets overlooked in. Um, even in community celebrations, you won't hear a peep about this in, in the, the made, you know, this metropolitan area. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you'll hear, and I, I, I don't want to make this sound the way it's about to sound, but you do hear about uh, Hispanic uh, heritage. You do hear about Black history, but the indigenous history and culture, it's just, it's still largely invisible in a lot of areas. And I, I, I largely because there's not many. And uh, there, there are some groups and, uh, they like to, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to protest, it's easy to do, but it's hard to bring things together. Mm-hmm. Right. A it, lot of it, people don't want to make waves. Right. <laughs> they, they, they want to be quiet. And, and that was, for me, that's, that's what it was all about, is like, it, it, I'm, I'm at that point where I don't want to have my fist out. I don't want to yell about things anymore. Mm-hmm. I would rather have conversations like this because when I'm yelling at somebody or you're yelling at me, we're, neither one of us is hearing what the other person saying. is saying. Right. It's through these kinds of conversations. And that's, again, that's why I use the language and the titles because the first thing that happens is how do you say that? Mm-hmm. Or what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And then it becomes, well, let me tell you. Yeah. And, right. and that's how, that's how understanding gets built. That's how bridges get built. And, and mm-hmm. that's what we really desperately need. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hearing that it makes me, you know, inspires me to um, to help us continue those conversations of building an indigenous artist community here in the Tampa Bay area. Certainly, as the Tampa Museum of Art, we um, you know pride ourselves on being um, inclusive and opening our doors to everyone. And um, I hope the three of us can continue this conversation um, after our panel today to see how we can further build those bridges to. Um, have some visibility for the indigenous artist community here in the region. That'd be amazing. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, another thread that I picked up on is the um, notion of social justice. Um, you know, Tony, you mentioned it, Karine, you especially mentioned it in yours. Um, and then I think, Craig, I think there is a theme with, you know, language, um, you know, um, inherently is political. Um, so, um, I thought we'd maybe think about um, those threads of social justice in your work. I mean, I know you just, you talked about it a bit more. Um, Kareen's work, I think, is particularly, you know, kind of the most, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, what? Uh, out there. Out That's there, a good most word kind for of it. overt <laughs> in, in talking about the similarities, I think, you know, between um, Indigenous communities, um, Black Lives Matter. Um, and also, too, I think a lot of that is, um, you know, while we were in the pandemic, we were so used to that isolation. And I think when you see yourselves in different groups, um, you see that we are su- we're separated by so many different things. Um, mm-hmm. uh, maybe Karina, if you wanna maybe expand a bit on that. Yeah, so a lot of my work includes things that I strongly believe in. Um, one piece that you guys didn't get to see, which is like my favorite piece is my piece called Burn. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and the back of the jacket, it's it's a, it's a uh, thrifted jacket that I had embellished with beadwork and painted with acrylics and it was charred and it was, it's my favorite piece that I've ever done. Mm -hmm. But the whole, the back of it says burn the patriarchy and I can attest, and it doesn't sound, it sounds crazy when you say it out loud, right? But um, Seminoles specifically, we're a matriarchal society. I don't know if it's Mm -hmm. the same for you guys. Um, So when I say burn the patriarchy, it's because we never had a patriarchy, right? So there's nothing really to burn on our end because that's how we live. We live as a matriarchal society. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it was on display at the Ringling. And I think that was my most asked about piece because Mm -hmm. people didn't understand. But then I got to teach them, right? And Mm -hmm. same thing. 
that they like to, that you also like to teach. And that's how I teach is through my art. And same thing with like, including social justice and social matters is, okay, that person might go and see this piece somewhere. And now if they, I hadn't had shown them, right. how would they have known, right? right? So then that person gets to go look up missing and murdered indigenous people, or they get to go, you know, look up why are the seminal people in matriarchal society or anything like that? And I think it's kind of like, it's, it's starting a conversation that they might not have had. And right. that's why I like to include stuff like that into my work because then people ask questions and then they have a better understanding or maybe they leave with a different understanding. And I think it's also pretty interesting that um, you say that social media is kind of your way of connecting yeah. with everyone. <laughs> and as we've seen in the past five years in particular, that social media has been our almost our biggest tool mm -hmm. for um, social justice and advocating for, you know, equal rights yeah. all across the board. Um, Tony, I want to bring this back to your um, sepia tone paintings, because I think that by um, highlighting, you know, the, um, the um, people in your paintings, there is that element of you're bringing to your audience, um, people who are viewing your art, um, the significance of them. Um, can you talk a little bit about that relationship? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I would like for you to try to say that a different way because I got lost halfway through. Oh, I'm like, door, like, gotcha. like, <laughs> um, Just in terms of connecting some okay. of the subjects in your paintings yes. to social themes. Right. Um, sort of like with uh, Te Ate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess what the social theme is that I, I personally, and I know others feel this way too. I personally want Native Americans to have a bigger voice, to have more say in everything. And not like what you say, not with your fist, with talk, sit down and talk across the, like they keep saying in the government across the aisle, which would love to see that one day, but to me, just to talk and see what's going on. And, to, and this is why I do this. This is why this happens. This is why my people are this way. Mm -hmm. And cause there's another piece that I, I love that I don't have, it's not showing, it's called Red Arm Panther, and how, unfortunately, uh, when the tribes were being gathered up and putting on reservations, they hired Indian scouts to help them. Mm -hmm. Well, this one man, Red Arm Panther, he was hired as an Indian scout. He was paid to help find Nez Pierce, mm -hmm. but he was also promised, if you do this, we'll take care of you. Well, once they got everybody, he was put on the reservation with them. So now, he not only betrayed his people, but now he's stuck with them having to, you know, answer for what he said. And it's because if he didn't, he would go hungry. Mm -hmm. If he didn't, he would not have a place to eat, a, pl have a place to live or eat. He'd be wearing blankets that uh, got smallpox on him and, and die. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want that. He was trying to take care of him and his family. Instead, it backfired on him. And that's what we don't want anymore. We don't want people promising stuff that's not going to happen right they know it's not going to happen so to have a community that trusts and love that's what's going to work and trust is the biggest thing we want we want to be trusted we want to trust others thank you um got on my high horse there so no that's great <laughs> craig i'm going to segue this into talking a little bit about kind of social themes and storytelling because again i think some of the biggest threads between all three of your works is this notion of storytelling and you do that through language. Um, how did you, um, like, what is your language study like? What is, you know, how do you connect say, um, you know, bits and pieces of language, the preservation of language, the history of language into making your artwork? Well, I'm very fortunate that one of my closest friends uh, in Montana is a language instructor. Um, and uh, another friend of mine uh, is, uh, he's the, the founder of the Oki Language Project. And uh, both Eugene and, and Jesse are, are good sounding boards for me sometimes and going back and forth because it's, it's totally different than what English is. This is a verb-based language. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I found very beautiful about the language, first of all, it's incredibly difficult for me to wrap my English tongue around a lot of those, those words, but... Um, it's all, everything's alive, everything's intentional. There's a purpose behind everything. And, and what I've discovered and, and, and what I've been taught and what I've been shown is that the language really embodies 
the people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how the culture is transferred. That's how the stories are told. It's It's been evident for thousands of years as people try and translate the Bible over and mm -hmm. over and over again. No, this version's right. No, that version's right. When you look at the original source material, when you look at uh, at the language that was being used, there are some words that will not you know, go over into English. And so when I, I've learned everything is intentional, everything has a purpose, mm -hmm. uh, everything, it, it, there's a life in it. And that's what I'm trying to learn. That's, I mean, and I'll spend the rest of my life trying to figure it out. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult. It's challenging, especially being that uh, the Blackfoot culture is kind of place-based and it's not like I can just, you know, call up a bunch of people and we have ceremony in my backyard. It doesn't work like that. You know, right. all of the sacred spaces are, you know, thousands of miles away and it, you know, all throughout Montana and Canada. And so it's, it's, it's tough for me to maintain that connection. Um, but I'm encouraged, you know, it's, a, you know, you do the best that you can. And, um, and when you get a chance to go, uh, those have been some of the most impactful moments is that, you know, just sitting before anybody got up in the morning and just listening to an elder talk. Don't say anything. Just listen, mm -hmm. and you know, mind blown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, it's interesting to hear you all talk. That there are just there are key words that come up. Um, this notion of trust, of listen, and to come together as one. Um, although the three of you are from, um, you know, different um, different backgrounds, different tribes, um, how can we all work together to make sure that those um, ideas, those themes, stuff like this. I think okay. listening coming and together. yeah, coming together, listening and amplifying native voices. Mm -hmm. Um, not, not just when it comes to art, but also when it comes to like social issues, um, how we feel about different things. I feel like often we don't get asked that. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. <laughs> well, basically not to come with an agenda. Yeah. If we, did, yeah, if we didn't sure. come with an agenda and thinking of ourselves, we'd probably get more done. Yeah. And there's so much of that. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, there's always this, when I have conversations, there always seems to be this defensiveness coming from the other side. Uh, you know, the, the argument that I get a lot is, uh, oh, your people were killing everybody long before, you know, white people got here. And my response to that has often been, well, that's interesting. If you show up and there's a bunch of, you know, half naked people with sticks mm -hmm. and you get off your boat in metal armor and spears and, and, and things like that. So who's really the more savage, the culture that, you know, can get on well by being you know, half naked with sticks or the ones that come with instruments of war, yeah, and I think you know, that we, the, the, the killing wasn't, you know, the, so it, it, it's those kinds of things, you know, people feel like they have to defend their position. We're at where we're at now. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you're, we're not going back and changing any anything like that. So we're at where we're at. Let's try and figure out how to go forward with respect from here. I have just one more question, and then um, I'm sorry we could we could talk for another another hour. I, <laughs> um, I want to ask you all one more question. I want to ask you, I want to do some quick lightning round questions, and then open it up to our audience for some Q and A. Um, we are at this moment right now in the art world. Um, where indigenous artists are, um, I think we're, I think indigenous artists are starting to receive much more attention of late. I'd say within the last two, three years um, than they have for for generations. For example, um, I would be remiss if I did not uh, mention that you know this year's um, Venice Biennale, the American Pavilion, is um, the selection um, the artist selected to represent America in the Venice Biennale next year is Jeffrey Gibson. Um, an Indigenous artist, and I think it's the first time that an Indigenous curator is being brought to the biennial, um, Kathleen Ash Milby. Um, the Whitney Museum, one of our kind of biggest benchmarks um, in terms of contemporary art, just did a uh, monumental K walking stick exhibition. And then I know right now at my alma mater, the Center for Curatorial Studies up at Bard College in upstate New York has a survey show on um, Native performance art since 1969. And then just recently there was a big, I think too also um, groundbreaking book um, that we should all add to our libraries um, entitled An Indigenous Present. I think it's one of the first kind of really large compilation volumes that um, kind of the art publishing world has 
um, put out there on Indigenous art. Um, while we're seeing greater strides in kind of this bigger art world, and I feel like I'm repeating myself, um, you know, how can we better, you know, what else can we do in Tampa to make sure that you all get that recognition, not just amongst your own community, but within just the broader Tampa Bay Area artist community, because you are Indigenous artists, but you're also part of you know, the larger artistic community here in Tampa, you know, what would be, um, aside from having, say, these own internal conversations, what can the community do to better support you? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a long-winded question. No, there. that's okay. <laughs> well, get out there. <laughs> if you want to know, get out there and yeah. see what's out there. Uh, get out of your little bubble. Um, or like I had one person say, get out of your little ghetto that you live in and see what's out there, see what else is being uh, going on between other people, other races, um, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's one thing I, I tell people, don't be afraid to ask, you know, and well, we won't bite. Well, not, <laughs> Maybe. Not, not, <laughs> not anymore. <Thank> <laughs> so we're, we'll welcome anybody's questions and, uh, we're not here to you know to fight and defend, but we're here to help and educate and teach and to keep everything moving in the forward direction and not forget our past at the same time. Right. Yeah. Well put. Thank you. Craig, thoughts? Come on, Craig, you got yeah. some. <laughs> I guess I would say um, think about it more than just the month of November. Yes. Uh, and I say that because for the last few years, uh, around the end of October, it seems like nobody knows how to plan, but around the end of October, my phone just starts blowing up yeah. and it's all these people going, Hey, can you do this? Hey, can yeah. you do that? Hey, can you do this? I'm like, well, why didn't you ask me that six months ago? You know, uh, the thing that I, I find interesting, uh, is that native people are still kind of, for whatever reason, lumped into these, these three stereotypes you have you know the pocahontas you have the medicine man and you have this noble savage warrior over here mm -hmm. and really it's my experience that it's folks like the ones that are sitting next to me there are people who like pizza they like basketball you know and it, it i think at the end of the day if you really look at all of us all of us we're really a whole lot more alike than we are different mm -hmm. and I, I know right now that our news media and our governments and everybody that they, they, they like to to try and make us see the differences, and I think stuff like this, all year round, all year round, all year round, yes. uh, would would go a long way in keeping people in in the eye. I mean, it's easy to to think of something during a month that's labeled something, mm -hmm. but then you can forget about it for the rest of the year, and it, you know. You're still here and not going anywhere. So, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Any last thoughts, Curry? I agree. Um, I think more often than not, you know, when I was in I was in college, one of my classes was on theology. They asked questions. Oh, where do you come from? Who are your people? Like, what what religion do you study? And I said, and there, all the kids were like, Native Americans still exist. I think that's a really big problem even today. Um, you, you know, I. I sometimes find myself talking to people, oh, you know, in my culture, da, 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 da. And they're like, what's your culture? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm Native American. I'm Seminole from, from here. And they're like, from here? I'm like, from here, 12,000 years ago from here. <laughs> and they look at me like, what? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you didn't know? You lived in Florida your whole life and you didn't know? I think um, educating, like, I know land acknowledgements and whatever are becoming like a really big thing, but like look up, there's whole websites where you can look up what people are from the land that you live on. And I think that's a really like great place to start mm -hmm. to connect yourself with more indigenous um, and native voices. And then even from there, like then just having a normal conversation with us. What do you like to do? I like to bake <laughs> yeah. and I like to play with my dogs and just like every other person, I think yeah. we're all, we're all the same. It really yeah. boils down to it. Mm -hmm. So that's think, actually, that's if, if I could jump in real yeah. quick, because that just reminds me of uh, something that a friend said to me uh, during a phone conversation the other day. Says, we in this country, North America, uh, are blessed with this tremendous opportunity to prosper. It would be really cool if just once in a while we could acknowledge those who have given us that land on which that opportunity to prosper exists. So yeah. I'm I was glad that you said that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Okay, I'm gonna switch to some lightning round questions. Just, I'll ask you just three of them. Okay. Um, so quick one word, two word answers. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> which artists inspire your work? Start with you. Uh, Howard Tarpin. Howard Tarpin. Yeah. Craig. Uh, can I give two? Yes. Uh, my brother Terrence and uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Andy Warhol. Oh. There you go. Interesting. Kareen. My dad, Brian mm -hmm. Zabeda. <laughs> oh, that's the best. So who I've learned everything from pretty much. <laughs> What's your favorite medium? Oh gosh. Uh, acrylics right now. Acrylics. I like that the best. I would have to agree. <laughs> I'm really big into textile work right now. So like my outfit I made, mm -hmm. stuff Beautiful. like that. It was just, I'm really into sewing at the moment, I guess. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, is there a specific material that's integral to your work? So a little bit picking up on medium. Yeah, still acrylics and canvas. Myself. I mean, I tried painting on boards, but I like the way the canvas feels and moves when you're working with it. It makes it more alive. I need really old paper. Yeah. Uh, that ledger stuff, and it's it's getting harder and more expensive to come by. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. Um, currently, fabrics. I'm into different fabrics and feels and stuff like that. <laughs> right. um, we're going to talk a little about your um, creative process. Favorite time of day to make art? Mm. Morning. I like doing in the morning. I like the light, natural light that comes in. Days when it's raining like this is kind of hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. When I can find the time to do it, you know. It <clears throat> Um, whenever, honestly, if I start something at eight o'clock at night, I'll keep going until four o'clock in the morning. It's probably my worst habit. <laughs> so morning, night, and whenever, whenever you can <laughs> covers all parts of the day. Um, lastly, where can someone, um, see your art? Well, uh, your art? Red Cloud Gallery, uh, High Country Art in LJ, Glass TP in Colorado. You can go to the Smithsonian. And look up my name and see my artwork there and go to the Booth Western Museum and see my art there also. <laughs> I have a small, I'm, I'm also at Red Cloud. Uh, you can go to my website. There's a small gallery over in Germany. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name <laughs> because it you know, would be, uh, be an embarrassment, but. Uh... Perfect. Social media. Um, I think I post where, what show I'm in next. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be in one at the Polisec Museum in mm -hmm. uh, Winter Park next month. Um, and then after that, a couple of different places, but I'm really bad with dates. So <laughs> if it's not in my phone, I don't know. But definitely social media. That's where I post most of where I'm, what I'm doing and where it's at. Instagram? Yeah. Instagram. I have a Facebook page as well. Just those two. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I think we will open it up to any questions. Do we have any coming in through the Q&A, Brittany? Um, we have one reminder to not forget the James Museum in St. Pete. Yes. They don't have a very uh, broad selection of Native art by Native artists. Actually, most of their museum is Native art of native people, but not by native people. So they have a very tiny, tiny section. I don't know if you guys have been. No. Very, very tiny little corner that's just native yeah. artists. So it's not actually the best place to visit native art in my opinion, but. I, I second that. Yeah. Uh, and the second question we got was, as a black woman who has always been told she has indigenous roots, I have no idea how to trace. I've always felt a strong connection. That said, would it be inappropriate for me to wear beadwork, own artwork, or have indigenous body art? I, I would, I'm gonna just go with what I'm told. Um, if it's indigenous made, if, it's, uh, if it was given to you or you purchased it from a native person, uh, that's, that's probably all right. I'm not gonna go so far as to you know, put a stamp of approval on body art, uh, but 
you know, if you if you obtain it from a native person, it's okay. Yeah. Um, native art, not native inspired, I guess, is what I see a lot on the, the yeah. kids say. You know? Yeah. Um, my dad always taught me that, um, like, if you were to do something like ancestry, right, and it came back that you were 15% Native American, if you don't know who your people were, what does that, what does that mean, yeah. you know? Um, so, like, I'm 25% Native American, and blood quantum to me or the percentage to me doesn't matter because I've yeah. been so deeply enriched in my culture that I know things that I should know. And that even if, you know, I have kids and they're only, they're not like an enrolled member of my tribe, it shouldn't matter because I will teach them everything that they need to know about their culture and their people and their history and their ancestors, that that's really what matters. Mm -hmm. Um, so I encourage everybody, like if, if you know, or you think you might know, go research that and figure it out, figure out what people you belong to. Um, because like a number on a, on a DNA test, isn't going to get you very far. Like knowing who your people are is, yeah. is core. I think to me, no, I totally agree with yeah. that because the only reason I knew that we had Cherokee in our family was from my grandfather yeah. who told me a story about my great grandmother who was full blooded Cherokee. Yeah. yeah. And that's what matters though. Those stories yeah. that were, were passed down to you. Yeah. yeah. He was, I guess he was my first elder. To tell me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great answer. Anything else? <clears throat> Well, with that, I think we are right on the nose at about two o'clock. Um, before I close out, I want to, again, once again, thank our collaborators um, at Hillsborough County, and particularly Jenny Cabrera and Kelly Trinka-Stone. Um, also want to thank our fantastic panelists today, Tony, Craig, and Corrine. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've given me a lot to think about, and I'm excited for us to dialogue off camera. Cool. <laughs> Thank you to Thank our you. Um, at home visitors. Thank you so much for joining our virtual panel today. Um, stay tuned. I hope that there are more conversations about Indigenous art, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>